Praise be Jesus and Mary and Joseph. God himself has such great esteem for St. Joseph that he entrusted to Joseph the two most precious treasures that he ever created. One, the person of Our Lady, and two, the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the dignity and holiness and glory of St. Joseph come from these two people. His glory is, one, again, that he is the spouse of the Virgin Mary, and two, that he was reputed to be the father of Jesus Christ. First, let's talk about St. Joseph and his marriage to Our Lady. St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine tell us that marriage is an indivisible union of souls or of hearts with consent. Pope John Paul II, in his apostolic exhortation on St. Joseph called Redemptoris Custos, says that the union of souls or of hearts in marriage was found in an exemplary manner in the marriage of Mary and Joseph. Because of his marriage, St. Joseph is nearest in dignity to the mother of God, nearer than all of the other saints. Leo XIII, in his encyclical on St. Joseph, and speaking of their marriage, says this, quote, for marriage is the most intimate of all unions, which from its essence imparts a community of gifts, a sharing of gifts between those that by it are joined together. Thus, in giving Joseph the Blessed Virgin as spouse, God appointed him to not only be her life's companion, the witness of her maidenhood, the protector of her honor, but also, by virtue of the conjugal tie, a participator in her sublime dignity, says Leo XIII. So let's make an analogy. Just as the dignity of our First Lady Melania comes from her being married to President Trump, so too the dignity of St. Joseph comes from his being the spouse of the Queen of Heaven. Mary Most Holy. And just as Melania has special privileges and receives special honors because she's the president's wife, so too St. Joseph receives special privileges and special honors because he's Mary's husband. Again, St. Augustine tells us this. He says that in Christ's parents, all the goods of marriage were realized, offspring, fidelity, and the sacrament. The offspring being the Lord Jesus himself, Fidelity, since there was no adultery in their marriage, and the sacrament, since there was no divorce. So Mary and Joseph had a true marriage. And let's remember this as well. The husband, St. Joseph, didn't run away from the difficulties of marriage. That was a sign that he was a real man, a man after God's own heart. Not running away from the difficulties is a sign of being mature, responsible, and trustworthy. Again, John Paul II says that St. Joseph, quote, took Mary in all the mystery of her motherhood. He took her together with the Son who had come into the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the marriage between Our Lady and St. Joseph, we also see the ingredients of what make a truly happy marriage. First, altruism and self-sacrifice as opposed to self-centeredness. Second, walking together on the same spiritual path and toward the same spiritual goal, as opposed to individualism or clashing worldviews between the spouses. And thirdly, self-control, as opposed to being controlled by our passions. So let's look at these one after another. Firstly, St. Joseph was altruistic. That means that he was more concerned about what was good for Mary and for Jesus than he was about his own personal projects. And he was also self-sacrificing. He realized that marriage works only when the spouses cultivate a spirit of sacrifice and of service toward one another. And that's exactly what he did. He put himself always at the service of his spouse, not again focusing on himself, but focusing on her and and their child. St. Paul said, quote, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5, 20, 25. And he says, quote, he who loves his wife loves himself, Ephesians 5, 28. Marriage flourishes when the spouses serve one another, and it languishes and diminishes and deteriorates when they just start serving themselves or when they start playing what's called the blame game. 
Secondly, regarding the recipe for a happy marriage, St. Joseph and Our Lady were walking together on the same spiritual path and in the same spiritual direction. Of course, they didn't have the same degree of holiness. Our Lady was all holy. She's second to none except to our Lord himself. But not being at the same level, shall we say, of holiness isn't what was important. What's important is that they were both sincerely searching to do the will of God and to love each other as God intended. They were both heading in the right spiritual direction, and that's what's essential. And even though St. Joseph wasn't as holy as Our Lady, in heaven he's probably the holiest person after her. An example of how they were walking in the same spiritual direction is seen in how the supernatural faith of St. Joseph, who believed what the angel told him in a dream regarding the miraculous pregnancy of Our Lady and took her as his wife, as we heard in Matthew verse chapter 1, verse 24, well, how that echoes the supernatural faith of Our Lady at the Annunciation, when she believed what the angel had told her and said, quote, let it be done unto me according to thy word, Luke 1, verse 38. Again, Saint Pope, Pope St. John Paul II says this, if Elizabeth said of the Redeemer's mother, blessed is she who believed, in a certain sense, this blessedness can be referred to Joseph as well since he, was, he responded positively to the word of God when it was communicated to him at the decisive moment. So when choosing a marriage partner, it's best to make sure that both of you are heading in the same spiritual direction and desirous to grow in holiness like Mary and Joseph. Otherwise, of course, there will be difficulties and there will be consequences. And don't say that someone didn't warn you, at least from the pulpit. Thirdly, St. Joseph exercised self-control in his marriage, in particular regarding the virtue of chastity. St. Jerome, St. Peter Damien, and St. Thomas Aquinas, among others, tell us that St. Joseph was a virgin when he married Our Lady, and he remained a virgin all his life, in spite of being married, just like Our Lady, who remained always a virgin. When Mother Teresa gave a talk at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. in 1994, and yes, the then President and First Lady Bill and Hillary Clinton were present at the breakfast, Mother Teresa talked on, among other things, natural family planning. And she said that once one of the poor people who came up to the sisters, after they had spoken on natural family planning, actually thanked them and said this, said, you people who practice chastity, you are the best people to teach us natural family planning because it's nothing more than self-control out of love for each other. Our Lady and St. Joseph's marriage was never, never physically consummated, and so they too exercised self-control. But even in normal marriages where couples have marital relations, self-control is necessary, it's needed. So men who can't quote-unquote control themselves or who can't remain chaste, even inside of marriage, need to look to St. Joseph and take him as a model. St. Joseph will give the grace to remain faithful and chaste to those who ask him. So that's the first glory of St. Joseph, being the spouse of the Virgin Mary. The second glory was and is that he was the custodian and legal father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to how Leo XIII describes the fatherhood of St. Joseph. He says this, quote, He set himself to protect what a mighty love and a daily sol- with a mighty love and a daily solicitude his spouse and the divine infant. Regularly by his work he earned what was necessary for the one and for the other for nourishment and for clothing. He guarded from death the child threatened by a monarch's jealousy, Herod's jealousy and found for him a refuge. In the miseries of the journey and in the bitternesses of exile, he was ever the companion, the assistant, and the upholder of the Virgin and of Jesus, says Saint Leo, says Pope Leo. Saint Joseph, says Pius XII, showed Jesus, quote, by a special gift from heaven, all the natural love, all the affectionate solicitude that the Father's heart can show. So Saint Joseph loved Jesus with the heart of a true father. Keep in mind also that all of the hidden life and all of the private life of our Lord from the time of his birth until his public ministry, all of it was entrusted to Saint Joseph. 
St. Joseph was an eyewitness to the birth of our Lord and to the adoration of the shepherds and the Magi. He conferred the name on Jesus in his presentation and circumcision in the temple. And John Paul II tells us that, quoting, conferring the name, Joseph declared his own legal fatherhood over Jesus, and in speaking the name, he proclaims the child's mission as Savior. And of course, St. Joseph raised Jesus, which included, obviously, feeding him, clothing him, educating him in the carpenter's trade, and even, as strange as it may sound, even instructing Jesus in the law of Moses and teaching him how to pray. In his divinity, of course, Christ needed no master, he needed no teacher. But as part of the emptying of himself, of which St. Paul speaks in the second chapter of his letter to the Philippians, Jesus allowed Joseph even the privilege of educating him. And we can be sure that St. Joseph was faithful in teaching his son God's law, because in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, it says this, what the fathers must do, quote, teach God's commandments diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. So St. Joseph, being a just man and fulfilling the law in every respect, therefore also taught the law of Moses to the child Jesus. Teaching the faith to their children is something that, unfortunately, most Catholic fathers neglect. Fathers, they do need to start teaching their sons and daughters at an early age who God is, how to pray, what are the truths of the faith, who are the saints, and so on. It's important not to leave that teaching to the school or to the CCD educator. It's the father's responsibility. And we need to learn from St. Joseph in this as well. Lastly, we'll just mention some other virtues of St. Joseph, some of which which we've already touched upon. Firstly, St. Joseph loved truth and he practiced love. John Paul II again writes, quote, Joseph experienced both love of the truth that pure contemplative love of the divine truth which radiated from the humanity of Christ, and he experienced the demands of love, that equally pure and selfless love required for his vocation to safeguard and develop the humanity of Jesus. Pope Paul VI adds that the fatherhood of St. Joseph was expressed concretely in his making his life a service, a sacrifice to the mystery of the incarnation, and to the redemptive mission connected with it. Having used his legal authority, which was his over the Holy Family, in order to make a total gift of himself, of his life, and of his work, and having turned his human vocation to domestic love into a superhuman oblation of self, an oblation of his heart and all his abilities into love placed at the service of the Messiah growing up in his house, says Pope Paul VI soon to be St. Paul VI. So St. Joseph's love of God's truth, because the truth is what sets us free, as Jesus tells us in St. John's Gospel, he loved God's truth, and he loved putting that truth into practice. Another virtue of St. Joseph is that he just, he simply did what was right. God told St. Catherine of Genoa this, excuse me, St. Catherine of Siena in her dialogue, God says this, I take delight in few words, and many works, few words and many works. The gospel records no words of St. Joseph as we know, but they tell us of his heroic deeds, of his blind obedience to God, his faithfulness to his duties, his being the protector and provider for Jesus and Mary. And Pope John Paul II tells us that, quote, work was the daily expression of love in the life of the family of Nazareth. St. Joseph, that means, was a man of action. He didn't get his sense of worth primarily from what he did, from being a carpenter, but rather he got his sense of worth first and foremost from who he was, a man created in the image and likeness of God and chosen through no merit of his own to be the husband and the earthly father of Jesus, but he was faithful in all the work that was entrusted to him. St. Joseph was also a contemplative and a man of deep prayer, Every day he had the privilege of seeing, studying, and trying to imitate the virtues, the sublime virtues of Jesus and of his spouse, Our Lady. 
He contemplated the goodness and the love of Jesus and Mary, and that goodness and love had a tremendous impact on his spiritual growth. We can imagine praying our family prayers with Jesus and Mary physically present in our home and being able to gaze upon them, upon the presence of God in them, you know, who wouldn't benefit tremendously spiritually from having such a, such a grace? And St. Joseph benefited tremendously from it. And naturally, one of the most outstanding virtues of St. Joseph was also his humility. There was room for anyone who wanted to visit the Holy Family in their small two-room house at Nazareth. There was room for anyone, but there was no room for pride in that house. Pope Paul VI says this, St. Joseph is the model of those humble ones that Christianity raises up to great destinies. He is the proof that in order to be a good and genuine follower of Christ, there is no need of great things. It is enough to have the common, simple, and human virtues, but they need to be true and authentic, says Pope Paul VI, echoing St. Therese of the Child Jesus. In closing, Pope Leo XIII tells us that St. Joseph is a model for all men to admire and to imitate. And this is what he says. The quote's rather long, but I think it's worth hearing. He says, Fathers of families find in St. Joseph the best personification of paternal solicitude and vigilance. Spouses, a perfect example of love, of peace, and of conjugal fidelity. Virgins at the same time find in him the model and the protector of virginal integrity. The noble of birth will learn of Joseph how to guard their dignity even in misfortune. The rich will understand by his lessons what are the goods most to be desired and won at the price of their labor. As to workmen, artisans, and persons of lesser degree, their recourse to Joseph is a special right, and his example is for their particular imitation. For Joseph, of royal blood, united by marriage to the greatest and holiest of women, reputed the father of the Son of God, passed his life in labor, and won by the toil of the artisan the needful support of his family. It is then true that the condition of the lowly had nothing, has nothing shameful in it, and the work of the laborer is not only not dishonoring, but can, if virtue be joined to it, be singularly ennobled. Joseph, content with his slight possessions, bore the trials consequent on a fortune so slender, with greatness of soul and imitation of his son, who having put on the form of a slave, being the Lord of life, subjected himself of his own free will to the spoliation and loss of everything, says Leo the Thirteenth. St. Joseph was declared patron of the Universal Church, on December 8, 1870, by then Pope Pius IX. Referring to his being declared universal patron, again, Leo XIII, in that encyclical, which we've already cited, which is called Quam Quam Pluris, 1889, he says that it was natural and worthy that as the blessed Joseph ministered to all the needs of the family at Nazareth and girded about with its protection, he should now cover the cloak of his heavenly patronage and defend the Church of Christ. Of course, there's much more we could say on St. Joseph, and we've already said too much. But let's just ask our Lord and Our Lady to give us the love for St. Joseph, similar to the love that they shared with him at Nazareth. And let's turn to St. Joseph with confidence in all of our needs, just like Jesus and Mary did in the house of Nazareth. Praise be Jesus and Mary and Joseph, now and forever.